Does that work? We're good? Okay. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Um, to let you know, I'm not here for myself. I'm here for you guys. Um, it, it brings joy to my heart to see all these kids out here interested in science. Um, so I've been doing this for a long time, so I'll give you a little background of who I am. So I actually was raised on a dairy farm in Linden, Washington. I grew up about four to five miles from the Canadian border. Um, I attended Central Washington University where I got a degree in microbiology. I, um, to give you a background of what I've done, I've worked at a potato farm. I've worked in a food processing facility. I've worked in a warehouse and a greenhouse. And what that, that, that did for me is it built me a good round background to where science was involved in every one of those aspects. And I didn't know it as a kid, but how that started getting my mind working and how I was very intrigued with processes and what was happening, not just working on a farm. Um, so it, it, it brought me to where I'm at today because of that. So I have over 29 years of laboratory history. Um, in 2006, I established my own laboratory. It's in Ferndale, Washington. It's at 12,000 square feet. We now have about 38 employees since I'd lasted this slide, which was just a month ago. Um, so we have a full microbiology department where we do plate counts, pathogens such as salmonella listeria, along with a full chemistry analysis where we do things such as uh, nutritional labels, think of the back of a soup can. We do um, pesticide analysis, we do vitamin analysis in our chemistry unit, heavy metal tests. And then we have this new division that is really unique. It's our molecular division. So in there, we do allergen testing. We do norovirus and hepatitis A and cyclospore testing. We're probably one of five labs in the US that, do, that offer this service. And in 2016, we added a MySeq, which is a genomic sequencing aspect. And that is, there's probably only three of us that actually do that in the US. So today what I'm really going to do is look at a um, method comparison of molecular focusing on PCR and sequencing and how we're using those technologies um, that are new in, in inventive ways. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about TCM, which is traditional culture methods. Traditional culture methods is taking a sample. So let's talk about a milk, the milk you drink. We take it and we put it in a broth that's called enrichment broth. Each broth is unique for what we're looking for. So for listeria, which is a major pathogen, we use demi Fraser broth. We put that milk in a one to 10 dilution of that broth, we incubate it for 24 hours, and then we put it on a plate. And then we incubate that for 24 hours. And on that plate, the plate is, a, is full of auger nutrients to grow listeria. Once that grows up, what the old methods were is we had to start doing a hunt and seek type thing. Start picking different colonies to see if we can have listeria on there. So it was just trial and error. It took a long time. It took five to 10 days for this old traditional method. Well, the industry didn't want to wait five to 10 days. Milk lasts 21 days on the shelf. They wanted faster. So along came PCR. PCR is, is DNA analysis. So we do the same thing with an enrichment broth and we enrich it. But instead of putting it on a plate, which took another 24 hours and then hunting and searching, we ran it through PCR, which is, and I'll explain PCR a little later, but PCR allowed us to get results in 20 to 24 hours. And I could say if it was positive or not. The thing with that is called presumptive because I'm not finding live bacteria. I'm finding bacteria fragments, DNA fragments. That doesn't necessarily mean they are alive. So if you use chlorine. Chlorine will destroy bacteria, but it leaves behind DNA fragments that I can detect with PCR. So then the next step we moved to was sequencing. Sequencing is taking those, that sample, sequencing it, or taking the results from the first two methods and running through a sequencer. And what a sequencer is doing is looking at the DNA profile, and that profile will give us a lot of information. And what that profile allows us to do is say, who is the problem? What is the problem? And where and how can I find it? Because once I get the sequence information, it's like a fingerprint. So I can go into the environment and start Testing. looking 
in the environment for that specific fingerprint for that bacteria I sequence. Testing, and what that testing. really does is it gives us a lot of data, and that data allows us to drive to action. Testing. Where the other two tests really just gave us information and didn't course of action and didn't give us a point of where to go, so it was just a hunt and search type deal. Now, if you look at these three met different techniques, I'm going to relate them to your senses. So when I have a jelly belly, and I have a red jelly belly sitting on this counter, and you see it, you, everybody has a different idea of what that red jelly belly is. Is it strawberry? Is it cherry? Is it cinnamon? That's your traditional culture method. You see it, you have this idea, but you don't really know. PCR is like a smell. So you take that jelly belly and you put it up to your nose. Does it smell like cinnamon? Does it smell like strawberry? But you don't know still. It's just a smell. What's the final test you do to determine what that jelly belly is? You put it in your mouth. You taste it. That's the sense that gives you everything. That's the final result that gives you all the information you needed. If you look at these three things the same way, where you have a sight, smell, taste, it gives you an idea of the amount of detail and data you get when we run these analysis. Well, let's go over DNA. So DNA is um, made up nucleotides. There's only four. And depending on how they're arranged, what order they are, they determine your genetic information. So it's G, G T, A, N, C. So that's just a small part. Like a typical bacteria looks like that. So that's the DNA information for a bacteria. We can't run sequence and test for everything. It's just too much data. So what we do is we look for specific strands within that major sequence, and we're gonna target those things. We build a primer, and we only look at a certain spot of it. And what that primer does, it gives us a, a small area that's unique that will help indicate what those bacteria are. And so what we do with PCR is we get a known set, primer set, and we try to align it with the known that's in the sample. And once we do PCR, what it does, it just starts replicating this sample over and over and over. So we build, instead of having one or two of these little profiles, we have millions of them, which increases our sensitivity so that we can now go look and get a reaction where if I only had one, it's, it's hard to find. So we've replicated it. And now we have all this information that's available to us to go look at, to sequence, and run PCR on. So all these DNA fragments are there. But is it good DNA? So what we do is we run gel electrophoresis on it. So what that is is we need a specific link. So we take that, that little goo that we have that is DNA fragments, we put it in a gel. Think of Jello. Jello is like a gel. We put a little bit in one end, we hit it with electric current, and watch it move through this gel. And we need it to fit. On the left-hand side of this glowing box at the bottom is a ladder. It's known weights. Um, it's called base pairs. So G and T together is a base pair. So we want so many base pairs. And since it weighs more, it takes it longer to move through the gel. So we need it to move at a certain rate and be in a certain area so we can use the run PCR on it or run sequencing on it. If it's too small, it's not good quality data. I can't find it. If it's too big, it doesn't work right. So let's talk about PCR. PCR is polymerase chain reaction. It's the amplification of the gene or genes. Uh, primers, primers are used to target a specific gene or genes of interest. We can use specific genes where we look at a, a bacteria like E. coli 0157 or we can use a universal gene, which is E. coli. So big or small. It's a presence absent type test. So at the bottom you'll see is the gene is blue, our target is the red spots. We look for the target, amplify it, and see lots of red. To your right is your standard PCR graph. So what you see is that solid green line at the bottom is our threshold. It has to go above that threshold for us to say it's positive. So you see it goes up in a curve, and that once it goes above and curves out, it says, oh, there's enough DNA present there to make it positive. So we're gonna talk about jelly bellies. It's a good example. So target approach with PCR. So we wanna look for something specific. So our question for this is, are there red jelly bellies in the sample? 
we run PCR looking for red jelly bellies and yes, we see red jelly bellies, this specific target. In the food industry, this would be looking for Listeria monocytogenes. Listeria monocytogenes is a pathogenic bacteria that makes people sick. It is, if you had cantaloupe outbreak that happened in Colorado, people died, Listeria monocytogenes was the culprit. So instead of doing a target approach, we're gonna do a non-target approach. So instead of saying, are there red jelly bellies in there? We're gonna say, are there jelly bellies that contain red? Bigger group. So we run through our PCR, uni universal primer for red. Now we see everything that contains red in there. So it's a different way, it's a more of a, a broader based approach looking for a bigger population. We can take those PCR stuff and we go to next generation sequencing. That's the type of sequencing we use. Years ago, there was Sanger sequencing, and you heard of the Human Genome Project. And with the Human Genome Project, they used Sanger sequencing to sequence the human genome. It took years, because it only does one strand at a time. Next generation sequencing, instead of taking a year to do it, we could do this in a week. It's a lot more powerful, a lot more in a, information generated, so it's the new, new technology and they call it next generation. So what we can do is we can take that PCR test that we ran where we amplified and amplified those sequences or we can take a whole sample and we can just take a whole sample and run it straight to sequencing. It's a non-targeted type approach and look for everything in the sample. So if we go back to our jelly belly sequence, so here we are as we looked and we decided there was jelly bellies that contain red. So with sequencing, we're gonna say is, what are those flavors? Where PCR will tell us it contains red, sequencing gives us more information. Not only can we say they're red, we can say they taste like cinnamon, raspberry, cotton candy, cherry. There's a lot more data generated with the sequencing approach. If we do a non-targeted approach, instead of asking, is it red? And what is the flavors of the red? We're just going, what's in there? And what are the flavors? So we just sequence that whole jar of Jelly Bellies, get all our flavors, all our colors, and we have all this information. It, it's a lot of data and a lot of work that goes into it, but we can use this for like a probiotic. If, if you take a probiotic at home, we can go into a, a multi-probiotic sample and tell you every type of bacteria is in there. So how's that work? So we get these DNA fragments. We take those DNA fragments and we do a tagmentation and we add a color to them. So there's 96 different colors we can use to start fluorescing. So each sample will get a specific color for it. And what we do is then we take that into our sequencer and that is the sequencer. It's about the size of a microwave oven. So we put that information, we put it into the sequencer and then it starts going. It takes about 18 hours to run. So it starts running through what we call a flow cell. And those flow cells are looking at these combinations of C, T, G, A. And different samples have different colors, so we index them. So we can start looking at this. So you see on the left, there's this big black spot with these little squares. To the right is actually one of those little squares. So we look at a small fragment. It's like two to six million copies that we look at. If I use a large, flow cell, we're talking five to six million, five to six hundred million types of um, fragments. So a lot of information. So current applications. In the industry, we're, not a lot of people are using sequencing to run samples, but we're using it to do a lot of, a lot of different information and we're, we're using it in ways that really are new and unique. Um, it's new technology. Sequencing has been around for probably a decade or more, but the application in the food industry, environmental science, is relatively new. There's very few people that are using it. Uh, I know we developed a method I'll talk about, but the University of Minnesota is another one that's using this, this method. So they're, they're a very good university that's local here. Um, so we use it for botanical identification, dietary supplement, Ingredient verification, we'll look at animal species, probiotics. We use it for plant pathogens. 
So pathogens that cause disease in plants, we use it for that. Um, microbial speciation, so we can look at if it's, instead of looking for E. coli, we look for E. coli 0157. We look at environmental swabs where food companies go out and they swab their facility. We start tracking if they have residential or transient populations. We've done a big environmental genomics um, program with the local conservation district. And we do microbiome analysis. And microbiome is, is when you go to your grandma's house or you go to somebody else's house and it smells different than yours, that's bacteria. That's the population that is unique to their house versus your house. That's a microbiome that's living there. So different locations will have different microbiomes. Different populations will have different microbiome. Microbiome for Minnesota water is different than the microbiome for Washington water. There's unique species that live in each location. So I'm going to start first concentrate on these, these first four areas and we're going to go into chamomile. So you go home, you make yourself a, a cup of chamomile tea. How do you know it's chamomile? The label says it's chamomile. You open up that package, you pour it out, and what do you see? Dry powder. Bits and particles. Green. Anything can be green. Lots of plants. So we can do sequencing to verify that it's chamomile. Well, when you have a field of chamomile, in the ditches, you usually have some mustard seed. Well, you got to be careful about how you test because that mustard seed could show up to be as a contaminant if you don't run your sample right. So we did a big case study, targeted versus non-targeted. So we took a chamomile, known chamomile sample. We targeted it with what's called universal ITS primers, then amplified it. So we took and we took that one gene and we amplified it so there's millions and what happens if there's a little bit of mustard seed in there and now it looks like there's a lot of mustard seed in there so in 2015 the state of New York took had a big DNA sequencing with dietary supplements big lawsuits saying that these these dietary supplements were contaminated with different products but what happens is they ran the sample the wrong way they use universal primers and amplified. So small, minute um, inclusions look like big inclusions. And the standard is that you can have about 2% of, of cross-contamination or a little bit of something else in there that's, that's okay. But with the test, the way they ran it, it looked like there was a lot in there. So if I did a whole sample, all I saw was chamomile. When I used my I2S primers, mustard showed up there just as much as chamomile. So we got to watch what we do. This technology is very powerful and if you don't run it the right way or look at it the right way, you can give a false positive result. So we got to be very careful how we use it. Another thing we do is you go down to your local restaurant and you order yourself a fish sandwich. Breaded white fish. So it says specific cod on there. How do you know a specific cod? Again, label says it. So what happens at the breading facility? They get these white pieces of fish, and that's all they get. Well, white fish looks like white fish. Is it pollock? Is it cod? Is it flounder? Is it something else, the grouper? Is it a cheaper version? You go to a fish processing facility, they don't just do one type of fish. They do a lot of types of fish. So did we have a cross-contamination? Did we actually have a company that was selling a cheaper fish at a higher price and, and being false? So we have um, issues like that. It's, it's a well-known issue. So what we could do is sequence that fish sandwich and make sure that it was caught. And we did this for CTV, which is uh, in Vancouver, BC. They had an issue with fish, and we did this for Dr. Oz. We've, we've done quite a few tests for Dr. Oz, and he went out and went to fast food restaurants, took a bunch of fish sandwiches, sent them to us, and we sequenced them. And there was a major corporation that listed Pacific Cod on their sandwich, and it didn't have any Pacific Cod in it. It was all Atlantic, it was all whiting, which is just a, a cheap version of white fish. 
So everybody was paying a premium for Pacific Cod when it wasn't Pacific Cod. So looking at it another way is fish meal is a big commodity that gets sold. So you get this brown powder, and it's supposed to be this fish meal. Well, what happens is, is people can cut it with, uh, with cheaper versions of meat. So you do ruminant byproduct testing. It's a PCR test that we can look at that fish and look to see if we have bovine, ovine, caprine in there. Um, but that test leaves out pork. So with sequencing, we can not only make sure that they're not adding a ruminant in there, they're not adding pork as well. So it also would say, oh, they cut it with grouper, and you got a cheaper version of, of fish in there. So sequencing gave us more information to really make sure we weren't get, buying what we were saying. We had another issue with probiotics. So this company came to us, they got in trouble with FDA, and said, hey, they said we don't have something. So we sequenced it. And they didn't have their second um, largest component, which is lactis. So they were selling this product not knowing that they didn't have one of the bacteria in there that they were supposed to have. Another thing that we do is, is, is a lot of people who drink yogurt, use sour cream, kombucha, they use bacteria to ferment. It's a process, and they want to make sure that that bacteria is the same and processes the same way so they can sell a consistent product. So what we can do is sequence their starting bacteria blends, and when there's an issue, we can go back and sequence and see if things have changed so we can fix it if they have an issue. So it's a, it's a tool that's useful to verify before and afters to make sure that they're giving the current products that are always the same. Next, we went into more of like environmental genomics. So sequencing as a diagnostic tool in environmental DNA analysis. So we identify species in waterways. We can do ecological investigations. We can go into a facility and look at, see if they're pathogens, if it's a transient resident. We can look at their microbiome, see if they're having, if they're selling lettuce, and the lettuce isn't lasting two weeks when it's supposed to. We can say, oh, you get this extra bacteria in here that is causing your lettuce to rot. Um, and we can use it to confirm different things, viruses. There's no real way to confirm viruses, so we can use sequencing as a, as a tool. So you can go out, take a water sample, and there's all kinds of DNA floating in that water sample. So we can start looking for amphibian DNA. We can look for fish. We can look for turtles. We can look for different things. There's actually on the news, you would have seen Loch Ness Monster. So they went out to Loch Ness, Lake Loch Ness, took a sample looking for Loch Ness Monster DNA. They didn't find it. They found an eel. So their theory now is it was just a large eel that's in Loch Ness. But DNA was used to start looking for Loch Ness Monster. So how's that done? So you go out and collect a water sample. We extract it. We filter it down so we concentrate everything in there. Then we go through a sequence. And that sequence, we can start looking for bull trout. We can look for sockeye. We can look for any types of fish. So we can identify what organisms are living there. Uh, it was done in Europe for a newt that they thought was extinct, and they found it. Um, not only are we looking for animals, we're looking for bacteria. It's a non-invasive way to monitor. We did this for um, the National Park Service at Great Lakes. They took samples, and we were looking for a specific amphibian. Um, the other thing we do is we can start looking at this when, and environmentally. If you look at our, our big jar of jelly bellies, Imagine that as a body of water, or imagine that as a, a we did a fecal reference database. So imagine this as a um, cow manure. Imagine it as human waste, a septic system. So within that, those things are, every jelly belly is representative of a bacteria. So we build this fingerprint, and we can take that fingerprint and compare it to a sample to see what is in there. So we did a year-long study with the Washington State Conservation Commission where we went out and developed a database. And we started building the database based on different animals and different um, manure profiles, building a microbial profile for these animals. So then we went into the water systems, pulled a water sample, and said, oh, here's our contamination. Our contamination was a septic system. So that was the way we ran it. 
this slide did not work for some reason. But they did a year-long study here, and in May they had a large hit. And in that large hit, we went out and found out it was a human waste issue. So we were able to help them instead of saying, what is it, and start hunting, we were saying, here's the focus, go look there. And they went there and, and found it. It, would, it helped narrow the search. So part of that project was fecal source reference catalog. You could make a microbial profile for different sources of, of fecal material. We, here's a list of some of them, pig, sheep, swan, raccoons. We had a lot of help from the community. They did a source tracker program where people in the community would call in and said, hey, I saw an elk over here. I saw a deer here. There's a big pile of geese here. So they could go out and pull samples. And what was specific, unique about that is when we started building this database profile using the microbiome, we found this out. And if you look, these are clusters. These, these are very significant. Horse did not overlap with dairy. It has a unique signature. Sheep was unique. Birds were unique. Humans were unique. All these started clustering away from each other. In the far right, you'll see the nooksack. That's the river we studied. So we went as far upstream as we can, pull samples. Do we see anything in the nooksack that overlapped with these others? And we didn't, which means we could use this to start looking for sources of contamination in the watershed. So the gold standard for doing that is fecal coliform plates. You, hi, you hear of high, high fecal coliform counts. They'll probably s close lakes and things because, hey, there's high E. coli counts, high fecal counts. What we found out for doing that, we started sequencing that information. And we found out those plates don't really indicate anything but high fecal coliform counts. They don't indicate a source or anything like that. Um, the DNA profile from that plate did not match a DNA profile for any of our fecal sources because it's, it's too narrow of our window and it's looking at too specific of a population. So we found out this standard that's been used for over 50 years gives us counts, but it really doesn't indicate what the problem is. So our next goal was, well, now that we've built this database, can we go out and pull samples of water? and verify that we can see those, those sources. So we went throughout the county and we took different salt water samples from different places. And remembering how this looked, knowing that since we're so unique, we can go out and look, they did spike samples. So what they did is they took water samples and added fecal material to them and tested us. So what you see is when they did spike the dairy lagoon, in a water, it matched our dairy lagoon in our database. So we started able to see that, yes, if you spike it with duck or birds, we see duck or birds. The one animal that didn't work on, dogs. Dogs eat everything. They go out, they'll, if they go lived on a dairy farm, dogs will go out and snack on dairy manure. They will go out and their population is not unique enough, so we'll have to take a lot more samples to parse out dog. And what is funny is, is dogs, right now, there's companies that will sequence your dog in London. They'll sequence the dog, and if they find dog manure on the, on the ground, they'll sequence the dog to manure. And if it matches your dog, you get fined. They had a pop issue with Europe where people were not cleaning up after themselves. So they used DNA sequencing to start finding people that had dogs and didn't clean up after themselves. So then we went out and took water analysis of, of unknown samples. One of the first things we saw was unknown bacteria. A couple things. Is it not in our fecal reference database, so we have to build it? Or is it a bacteria population that has no information and has never been discovered? DNA is a new tool. We're doing things that we haven't, nobody's ever done so there may be populations that we don't know about that we will discover. The other thing we did is we took upstream, and every sample we took had that background, kind of like a positive control saying, yes, this is working, we see your background, except for these samples. These samples were so contaminated with fecal material that the background went away, and we saw the, the issues. It happened to be is, is a company that 
houses, takes fecal material from uh, septic systems, it takes it from dairy lagoons, and he has a big holding tank, and he uses it, ferments it, and spreads it out. It was spreading it too heavy, and it was going into his local stream. So taking that, we also can do that for process facility monitoring. So we can go through, they do environmental monitoring in their process facilities, and they take swabs to see if they have listeria and if they have salmonella. And what they can do then is, is one of our companies that we worked for was swabbing, and you can see they have the same strains show up except for three times. So they had a residential population that they couldn't kill and they weren't getting rid of. So we're working on that. But in June and July, a new strain showed up. And then we saw in September. Well, we start looking at this. These are when they get new shipments of, of seed in. So come June, July, they had two big loads come in of new seed, and it's an outside population that was brought in with the new seeds. Same thing as, as, as September. One came from Canada, one's from the Midwest of the seeds. The first in June and July was a Canadian shipment. A different population came up from the Midwest. Another big project we've done is gloves. Everybody knows about disposable gloves. Nobody thinks about them. They just put them on. I'm clean. Well, not the case. Disposable gloves aren't clean. We've done big microbiomes, and we detected human pathogens in them. Listeria monocytogenes was found in a glove, that, a latex glove. So this was presented at a big national conference. Um, we were doing a study for a guy. He's still doing it. He's still looking at different gloves. But just because you put on latex gloves does not mean that you're a sterile hands. New thing that's been happening, virus de testing. So you might have heard about berries recalls due to hepatitis A or norovirus. Uh, FDA has been only running this for the last three years. We started doing this test about the same time they did. I'm working with a professor out of North Carolina State who is known as Dr. Norovirus. So we, we pointed out some issues with their methods. The traditional method is just a PCR detection. We built titers for PCR to look at different levels of the virus. At about 40 cycles, and a cycle is the number of times we amplify and cool and heat and cool and heat, we see a little bit of a reaction. Well, it's inconsistent there, but the FDA was calling these samples positive. Well, we detected it during our screening process, and the question was, is it real or isn't it real? So there's no way to confirm this. Bacteria I can put on a plate and see if it grows. Virus I can't. So we went through sequencing. So we took that amplicon we got at the 40 cycles, went it through the sequencer, and it confirmed positive. So we had a true virus positive sample there. Seeing some of the literature that's been published, 40% of those PCR positives are negative. So that's 40% of the recalls are false recalls costing these companies millions of dollars. So sequencing is the only way to make sure that they are true positives. The other thing we've done is plant pathogen detection. So you have large seed potato farmers. They have to make sure their seed is clean before they ship it to other places. They ship to Idaho, California, and that's where you grow your potatoes for, that you eat. So they have PVY rules and different things like that that they have to make sure it's clean. Well, the traditional method for potato virus is leaf tissue. It takes three months to plant this potato and grow a leaf to test. We've developed a PCR method that looks at the tuber. So I can take the, the tuber straight, scrape it out, run PCR on it, and get a positive. The thing is, there's only certain strains that are considered pathogenic. So what do we do? We take that PCR. We run it through the sequencer. The sequencer will tell us, yes, we have PVY and it's strain N-WI, which is a pathogenic strain. You can't sell those potatoes. So what this does is high resolution DNA analysis just gets more and more data. And with more data, we get a clearer and clearer picture of what's happening. Um, so it, the one big thing that's a new wave of, of degrees that's happening is bioinformatics. So we partner with practical informatics. Um, 
It's the husband of our molecular division director. And what he's done is, is bioinformatics has taken biological information and using computers. So we generate this big set of data of just A's and G's and C's and T's. And if I look at it, like the one screen, it's just letters. I have no idea what it is. He builds these pipelines in these computer programs that start taking that information, comparing it to a reference material, and starts linking those two things together. So it's a lot of big data. You'll hear Walmart use the term big data. You'll hear Wall Street use the term big data. With the computers that we have now, we can get a lot of information. And a lot of information means a lot of power and a lot of, of technology and databases that we need to, to look at. But if you're interested in computers and biology, there is a field that combines the two. So with that, um, it's, DNA sequencing is a powerful tool. Uh, it helps drive data-driven decisions. Um, it, if, it informs us, helps us with follow-up questions, and helps fill in a story when there's an issue. So, questions? Thank you. So, so the material that I need for DNA, so if I did a DNA sample, I need a, a just a thumbnail of material. Um, for the amount of DNA I need, we have a, a thing called a qubit that measures DNA, um, and that has to be a certain level. We usually like a, a 1.0 nanograms per gram of DNA information. DNA to, to run through the sequencer. We can do it with lower, but then our, our quality is not quite as good. Yeah. Can you run? Right, yes. So the machine I use, it's called Illumina MySeq, um, is the same machine that CDC uses, FDA uses, different hospitals uses. We could run human DNA. Um, we don't. There's a lot of regulations toward that. But yes, we could do human DNA. So we actually, when we built our fecal database, we handled human DNA from fecal material. Crime. Um, we do not, again, it, it, that's, so when you think of the CSI type stuff, um, when you see, it, we'll go with TV. So TV doesn't tell you how clean you have to be. So crime, crime lab stuff, you have to be almost suited up to handle the DNA because your DNA falls. It, in that chair that you're sitting in, the chair next to you, I could probably take a sample and tell you the last four people that sat there. So if you're not clean, and you're not really watching how you do it, you can contaminate a sample. So since we're doing more food environmental stuff, our facility isn't built to handle that. Um, part of it is a business model. It's a liability issue and how much insurance you want to cover. Uh, insurance companies, for example, if I went in and did home mold testing, they won't let me do it unless I want to have $10 million of liability insurance. Um, but yeah, it gets kind of tricky as a business model to do that type. 
the same process. It's the same process. So what's unique about human DNA, let's, let's just go there, is what the DNA I did for bacteria, I'm looking for specific markers that are unique to the bacteria. I go to the human DNA and I run a DNA analysis and if I use the same technique, it all looks the same. No matter if you're blue eyed, brown eyed, green eye, it's the same. With human DNA, they're looking for abnormalities in the DNA that change what your eyes look for. There's always a base. So the abnormalities determine if you have green eyes. The abnormalities determine if it's brown or blue. So it's a different way of looking at the data. Yes? Um, when you sequence something, like, how do you mathematically set that up to work and, like, like actually make it happen? Make it ha When I sequence something? Yes. Yes. Okay, sequencing something. So what I do for sequencing is um, there's different ways to do it. There's an extraction process. So some of the samples, like if I get a powder in of chamomile, I'll, I'll add liquid nitrogen to it, which breaks up the fragments and breaks up the, the bonds so I can make it into a fine powder. And then I'll use, depending on different techniques, I can, I can add a, it, there's centrifuge tubes that have fine, fine pores in it, tiny, tiny pores. And what I can do is add methyl alcohol to it or ethanol or different solvents to that sample. And I, and I could shake it up and I put it in this centrifuge tube about this big. And I spin that thing at 50,000 RPMs. And what that does is forces the DNA through these little micro tubes. So my sample sits on top and my DNA goes to the very bottom. And after centrifuging it, putting the DNA down here, I take the top off, throw it out, and now I have my DNA in a little tube. So they take that part and I take 10 microliters about the size of a needle, and I add that to another tube, and to there I add like um, indexes, that colors, that one where you saw all the colors, just dots, so I'll end an index to that, and what that index is, is it's a piece of fragment that has a specific color to it, so I'll add that, and it has a binding protein to it, which will bind to the DNA, so what happens is that if I add green to this sample, it binds to it. If I add red to this sample, it binds to it. And what that does, it allows me to take all those little fragments and blend them together. And then I put it in my machine. And depending on color, the color fluoresces. And red sample says, oh, it was chamomile. The blue sample was broccoli seed. And so I can use it that way to determine my sample. Um, so could you actually sequence a jar of jelly bellies? Can I ask the shape? Um, actually, jelly bellies you can't sequence. You know why? There's no DNA in, in jelly bellies. Oh. Jelly bellies are all made up of sugar and chemicals. So it takes anywhere, just to give you an idea chemically, there's probably 32 different chemicals to make the flavor watermelon. Whoa. So... It would be a chemical analysis, not actually. So you can only sequence living things? Yes, I can only sequence things that are living with DNA. So like a bug, DNA. A rock, no DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just going to say, like, you can't sequence a rock. Yeah, you can't sequence a rock, no. Yeah. Yeah, you want to see what I throw away? It's about this big. Uh, right now, I got a draw, drawer full of, of flow cells. A flow cell is, is probably about the size of two stamps, and it has a small channel in it that's like the size of a, a needle, and that's where all the DNA goes flowing through. So when I get done with it, right now. Um, we just, we just got bags and bags of it. I will probably call Illumina 
because they'll probably reuse and redo some. And most of it's just plastic. So there's not much to I actually brought samples. You can, I can show you a flow cell. It's, it's a neat little piece of equipment. No, no, it's not a danger. Yeah, because DNA lasts forever. But when I run a DNA sample, it's, 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 it's just a free, there's really no harmful thing in the DNA. If I run Listeria and it's DNA Listeria, it's dead. I kill everything. I hit it with heat. I hit it with uh, liquid nitrogen. So it destroys because if it's alive, it's bound to something and I can't get at it. So I need to destroy it to break up so I have DNA fragments. Without DNA fragments, I can't test it. Um, I wanted to ask you about the contamination part of your lecture. You said that you found contamination on latex gloves. Yes. Was that both the inside and the outside of the glove? And how big of a sample, like, is that common? Well, that, nobody's done that study. There's a, a guy out of Florida that we're doing the study for. And he's done like three or four of them now. Um, and so we do the inside and the outside of the glove because when you're manufacturing, they actually the outside of the glove is in, in the inside of the cone and it gets dipped and it comes out and then they pull it off and it turns it inside out. Um, so we've done both. Um, we've seen, seen it in both places because of their process. Because if you look at the one slide, I'm going to bring it up. Um, the one slide for latex gloves is just a dip of liquid. So this is a latex glove manufacturing process. They just dip that, that hand in this vat and it comes out and assists there and cools and forms a glove. Yeah, I, I think so. He's presented at a few things and uh, some of these, what, what the big driving force here is there's a glove manufacturer says their process is the best. So they started testing all these other glove manufacturers to see what, how dirty they are. Yeah. What type of material is the DNA tested in? What type of material is the DNA tested in? What type of materials do I DNA test for? Oh, so we have a Tested liquid, in. what? Tested in, like, Test. what, what do they put it on or something? Like, what do they put it on? The material. I'm, I cannot. Um, what do, um, what's the material that it's tested in? Um, what's the material that um, the DNA is tested in? Yeah, one more question. Um, if the sequencing goes wrong, does it damage the DNA? If, if the sequence goes wrong, does it damage the DNA? Yeah, so, so what happens is, and we have that. Um, so if a sequence goes bad, I have to start all over. So I have to make sure when I when I extract my DNA, I can run it three or four times because if one goes bad, I just have to throw it away and start over. So, and a sequencer costs like $150,000. And the little flow cell, the cheapest ones are about $400. And the most expensive are about $3,000. So we don't like it if they go bad. <laughs> um, how does DNA can make it like um, perfect. How much DNA do you test? How much DNA do you test? Do, how much do we run? Um, 
We do quite a bit of DNA testing. So we have, we usually are running two to three times a week. And a typical flow cell, we try to put 12 to 15 samples on. So. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. How much does it cost to do one DNA sequencing? Well, how much does it cost? How much do I charge, or how much does it cost me? To <laughs> <laughs> Different question. Uh, typically, the cost, I'm not going to talk about human time. But, so, like a flow cell, it, it's, there's a nano flow cell. And a nano flow cell is about $250. I can run one sample on there, I can run about 10 samples on there. Um, to index it and, and mark it with that fluorescent dye, that's about $25 to $30. Then the materials to extract and get, get from a leaf sample to DNA, there's probably about another $20 to $25 in there. So typically I'm running about $100 a sample. Uh, depending on what it is, we'll charge $180 to $250. <coughs> I think cool. Who's your biggest client, government or private industry? Private industry. So right now, just to give everybody a background, I'll, I'll touch okay. So FDA has, has changed the rules. They're now doing more regulation on food. Um, Ten years ago, they had no clout. Uh, there's a new law called FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which allowed FDA to have a little more clout in what they can go in and, and shut down. So they're starting to do more. So they're changing the rules. They're requiring more. Um, but the biggest driving force is Costco, Walmart, uh, Whole Foods. They're the ones that are holding companies that they buy from to standards. And that company is holding who they buy from standards. There's a standard called SQF. And if you're an SQF facility, you buy from an SQF facility. So that's where the, the biggest industry changers are those large corporations that are buying. So I think with that we will <coughs> close this particular first session of roundtable. So let's first make sure that we thank Mr. Kent Ustra here for coming here for us. So here is a little token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you.